Hey, Jonathan. Manny. How's Great it going? Fantastic. It's been a little while since you've been here. Sorry, I got to start this. Got to get it going. Uh, you brought a couple of friends. I did. I did. <laughs> Hello, friends. Hello. How's it going? Good to have you guys in the studio. It's great to have actually you guys in the studio. We're going to have a really good TNT show today. It's been great. I'm looking Likewise. forward to it, right? You brought up some really good talking points. And then I want to introduce uh, to my left, I guess I got our Beto here. And uh, what's the name of the business again? Sorry, Premier Physio. Yeah, Premier Physio and uh, Sports Medicine. Um, so, yeah, it's a clinic there. We started um, it's just under a year now. A couple of weeks, actually, be the, the year, one year mark. So, yeah. And then obviously got, got in touch with Jonathan through the clinic and had some really neat organic conversations that kind of snowballed to where we are today. Yeah. Thanks but for being here. Yeah, You're you. dealing with a lot of stuff. You're like physiotherapist, exercise psychologist, spinal manipulative therapist. Yeah. Yeah. So um, exercise physiology, um, spinal manipula manipulation. So like basically like adjustments, if you will, that's kind of the one rhetoric people can affiliate with um, a bit easier. Um, but it, it's just a way that's to say it's one designation of something I can do in clinic. I know a bunch of 30 year old tradespeople that need you. Yeah. Because <laughs> they're being stupid about how they're doing their job. Well, they always like to wait to the very last minute when they can't do their job anymore before they man to do and trades man yeah. equals stupid and let problems last as yeah. long as possible. Yeah. And I have that conversation so many times in clinic. It's very, very well rehearsed just because it happens all the time. I picture them with all their friends on the site just rehearsing it, trying to figure it out. Let me share the deets here. 905-417-9991. It's on Instagram at premier.physio. And then your email is reception at premierphysiotherapy.com. And the website, again, is uh, premierphysiotherapy.com. Uh, and then Selena. Hi. Hi. Nice to be on the show. Thank, Thank you very you much. Thank you for the opportunity. Making the time. You brought a spectator there. I always acknowledge well, the spectators. Course. I don't care who they are. They're always there on the side. Uh, you're lead nurse and CEO of OpuLife. Yes, that and, is right. And your phone number to reach you is 647-400-1074. Email is selena at ocu, oc, sorry, opulife.ca. The website is www.opulife.ca. And then on Instagram is opulife.ca. And also on Facebook and LinkedIn. You're also on Facebook and LinkedIn. Yeah. No. Yeah. On all, yeah, both of them, right? Yeah. And then Jonathan's back. Hello, hello. Here, I got your deets again. JonathanSinelli.com and then at JonathanSinelli on Instagram. And then you can reach him at JC at JonathanSinelli.com and then 416-717-4139. I should be getting better at this, man, reading now that I'm in my 50s. <laughs> it's a show. doesn't matter. <laughs> um, I, I, this is, okay, sorry, sorry. Selena, I didn't even get into what is your specialty? So I'm a nurse by background, but OpuLife is a home care company. So we provide services in people's homes wherever they call home. So if that is a hospital because they've been there for long enough or the residential home or retirement home or long-term care home, we help them with their activities of daily living. So that anything from keeping their home clean to medical needs like nursing, wound care, um, as well as uh, foot care. How long have you been doing that now? Uh, OpuLife is just over a year, uh, but I've been in nursing for about five years, and I've been in home care for just under 10. Have we seen a huge uptick? In terms of home care? Yes, there's definitely a need, especially with long-term care. With the aging population, one, because the, there's going to be a ton of influx of seniors that are coming because everybody has to age, right? Um, but also the delay in long-term care building. So there's not enough beds for the amount of people that are aging. What would you prefer? I mean, I just want to get going. John. Yeah. You want to throw yeah. It this is, this is here. Just, because the thing is, like, I, I personally, I'm not going to dive into it because of my personal life, but we all, like you said, we're all going to go through this. Exactly. If you've got parents or uncles or whatever, like, mm -hmm. and you eventually will become one, right? And um, would you prefer, I'm, I'm big on aging in place. I'd rather stay put exactly. where it's your last home or what have you and make that home suitable for your needs when you get to that point. Exactly. Would you prefer that instead of, being carted off to a long term. Oh, of course. And yeah. a lot of our clients want to stay at home. So there was a there was a stat that went out that said 96% of Ontarians want to stay at home as long as possible. So that is a huge stat because it shows that everybody wants to stay at home. Yeah. Um, so like part of OpuLife's mission is to provide people with the resources and support to remain at home as long as possible. Um, but sometimes there is those cases where you can. So like if there's Alzheimer's, which everybody knows is an increasing disease um, that's happening amongst the senior population. Usually exit seeking where they're trying to leave their home is a, is something that they usually happens. So when they do that, they try to leave their home and we've had clients that through the night, they uh, 
they just walk on the highway. So, or they get lost, right? And when those cases happen, it's really hard to stay at home. And there are certain things you can do, like you can mask doors, you can like put up um, yeah, a painting, but like sometimes that's a little bit harder and it's a lot on the family. So we take it case by case, but those are the extreme cases. A lot of people want to stay home and they can stay at home. It's just knowing the option. And that's why, ho- that's why we love talking like uh, today about home care because a lot of people we notice don't know what home care is and that they didn't know it was an option. They thought just retirement home or long-term care home. No, I know it's an option. It just it, sometimes it gets a little expensive and it gets a lot of taxing on the family and then you start really finding out the true colors of a family yeah. depending on how big the family is. And if yes. you're talking about European families, it's usually big. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. But I, I, am I fair to say with both of you guys, in an ideal world, is this almost preventable? Yeah, I, I think I don't want to like. No, it's a great question. So, like, one thing I always say um, in clinic is that as we age, right, that there's a demand of life that's required to perform our daily tasks, and that's yeah. relative exactly, yeah. to to everyone, right? So, um, and the metaphor I always use in clinic is like, what's your university level algebra, right? And you just have to make sure you have consistently have these prerequisites to achieve that, right? Oftentimes, what ends up people doing over time is that they just don't and they, they just stop doing things and so there's this disparity between what they're able to do which obviously continuously goes down as we get older and we say it's age and i say it's you're not wrong it's just the wrong unit of measurement it's time right so yeah. this discrepancy becomes so large of like hey this is what we're trying to do but over time unless we're not making sure we're sustaining that ability effectively we're just getting worse mm-hmm. right and so typically with more time it, that disparity will become large enough where we're not going to feel good right or we lose the capability to do stairs so then what do we do well we shrink that gap but how do we do it well instead of increasing or regaining that ability right oftentimes we say well let's not do stairs so now you shrunk it right so we went from here this is what we do day to day let's bring it down here so effectively we shrunk that gap but then guess what you're still really not handling the issue so you're still going to get weaker and that'll go down. So what are you gonna do now? Well, I can't do stairs. Now I'm only gonna walk within 10 meters. And so effectively you continue that cycle where, you know, as Selena said, you might end up in a home care away from home. I'm sure that you guys are seeing it. Like yeah. it's gonna get really bad soon. Mm-hmm. In terms of the population? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um, there's a bunch of stats that show how we have more of an aging population than we can manage. So we don't have enough resources, hospital support, clinic support, yeah. home care support, long-term care. Like there's not enough. And I know there's a lot being done, uh, but it's not quick enough. And we all know that, right, for what's coming. And a lot of it's taking, we call it caregiver burnout. So it's ending up, like you said, on the family Right. So when there's not resources, who's going to do it? Obviously, as a family member, you're going to try to step in. But then that takes on the sandwich generation where you have your kids and then you have your parents um, and then you have a career. So they that's pass construction. it on to their own kids to help out, then which you, I don't yeah. think is fair. No. Well, you can all chip in. But at the end of the day, they're also not professionals that have that understanding. So I know some families are like, well, like home care, you mentioned is expensive. Home care is relatively the same price as coming going into a retirement home. If you know, it can actually be cheaper if you know how to, if you have the resources to put into place that kind of prevents, like not needing a stair lift, for example, so you yeah. can do stairs. Um, but if, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought now. No, <laughs> this is super, super, this is what, like, this gets me amplified because it's exactly that. You brought up the point where, People don't want to leave their homes, right? Like yeah. aging populations of European background. No, I'm going to die in my home, right? And yes. the stress, let's let's bring this up, the stress that, that adds to the families, right? Yeah. That's the whole... Well, I, I also want to touch upon, like, and we'll, we'll dive into a lot of this stuff. Yeah. I want to touch upon, I, I, I kind of mentioned something about how you get the true colors of the family coming out at that yeah. point. And then everyone becomes selfish for whatever reason, right? It's just it's just human nature to be that way. And your interests are personal at that point. It's not collective at that point. That's where I get frustrated mm-hmm. about being in that situation. And as you get older, um, like myself, I start having many more conversations like this. So when I start seeing 30-something eating incorrectly and exercising incorrectly or lack of exercising or mental stimulation, like just... I'm like, you're on a path 
to become a part of this population that you should not really be a part of. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then when I look at it, when I go back to Europe and I'm walking around and I see the old men, I wouldn't say they're, you know, Usain Bolt or anything like that, but they're <laughs> vibrant. They're, you know, they're not yeah. struggling to get out of a cafe chair. Mm -hmm. They had their, not that they had their espresso and they're moving around. The thing is that they're moving around yeah. in a yes. different environment, which is a lot healthier. And so here in Canada, I think we're hugely victims to just like, it is what it is. So then I'm just inevitably going to be a part of that population. But that's not the case. I find that like a lot of times is that there's an autonomy that you, each person needs to take on themselves, right? And so it, you just end up sort of being a vehicle within yourself. And you don't, you don't, you're not necessarily cognizant of that, right? And there's, there's just literally the simplest things to ensure the quality of life is so much better, right? Because I think there's a, a very relatively cliche phrase is that like we're taking longer to die, but we're living less. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah. And that, that, that's part of it. Right. And there's so simple things and it's the lowest hanging fruit, right? Sleep well, you know, minimize alcohol consumption to a large degree, exercise. And then that, that in itself will add at least a several years to your life, if not make it better. But even in the European culture, and they mm -hmm. did a bunch of studies about it, about how the social and the community aspect, having such social support is, can be like such a determinant of their quality of health. So mm -hmm. if you notice in the European culture, they, one, they do so many stairs. Like I went to Cinque Terre with, with Ben and the stairs were more than we could even do, but these 60, 70 year olds were doing it no problem. I was like, holy, I can't even do these. And I go to the gym every day. But they also have this community that where they do that together or they have they have this like healthy way of living. So they eat together. They're not eating because they have to. They're eating because they enjoy it. Um, and they're also their diet's a little bit better too, right? But a the lot move better, yeah. a lot better. And that has to do with quality, which is a total different topic. The food here sucks. It's <laughs> just like, I don't give a shit. Like, I mean, like GMO. Yeah. Should be written in the word Canada. Yeah. Like it's just stupid, mm. right? And the cost of living is so much higher, right? Yeah. Like you yeah. need to. But um, here's the thing is like I've had health people on the show and it's free to do push ups. It's yep. free yes, to go for a walk. Exactly. When you are still vibrant. Even if you got a kink in your leg or whatever, it's still okay to go for a slight walk. And w one thing that Selena said too is that like the, the social element too is like that other element short of the physical health that you know you kind of mentioned in there is that I lived in England twice, uh, or sorry, uh, in Europe twice. Um in largely to what Selena was saying is that, and I, for me, I think it's a large part to the landscape of it, right? Is that in Europe, you have all these small, very unique little towns. They're, they're towns, yeah. right? So v everything's very accessible. Everything is meant to be together and social. Whereas we come out here and it's just rows and grid patterns of homes. And to, to sort of have that, you have to go away and drive. And it's more a inconvenience to do that. Whereas in Europe, right, we're, the, the components of social health isn't paramount, right? But then we have that lacking. Well, we remove it here. Yeah. Like it's purposely removed. Like we're, we oh. rather focus on looking at a device and be distracted. I mean, adults are guilty of this. Like well, kids we, are doing it. They're growing yeah. up. They're the first generation that's doing it primarily. Well, we also have such a stress on independence too. Like we want to be doing things by ourselves. And one of the questions that it was a speaking point was barriers to getting help is we want it like we have this sense of dignity of doing it ourselves and not wanting that social support like in my in our industry the biggest thing is i don't need it i don't need it i don't want it i want to do it by myself it doesn't matter I, i'll i'll be down on the ground and i don't want the help right and that's just that sense of dignity to say hey i've been doing it on my own for so long mm -hmm. but that's also instilled in society to say you're only competent when you are doing it by yourself Right. And it's it's a controversial thing, but it's something definitely that we've seen over time. Um, and it's so unfortunate because it does decrease the quality of life, especially later in years, because you become so isolated. And we see that social isolation is definitely a cyclical where it becomes you're socially you don't want anybody. Then no one wants to be around you because you if you do come, then you're pushing them away. And that makes you even more isolated and it just keeps going. So is that because people are reaching out for help and then they're not getting it, whether they have their own family or friends that are saying, sure, I'll be there. I'll help you whenever you need it, whatever you need, all the crap. And then when it's time to ask for it, they don't deliver. So then you're like, I'm getting tired of asking people mm -hmm. and then they're not delivering because that's what's happening to me. And that's how your circle of friends just get smaller and smaller. Yeah. And then I'm like, well, screw you then. It basically, I become more independent. I think a lot of the times that like, as much as we say that, you know, people don't take it serious and then, 
I think the larger half of it thereafter is that they think they're a burden to sort of yeah. ask for that help, right? Like mm -hmm. if I have an issue, like I don't want to trouble Selena with my issue, right? Like she's got her own things. And so th I think that's the probably the biggest determinant of sort of people not actually then reaching out for help. Um, at least that's what we found with sort of uh, the sort of mental health in, in clinic where we have like Teresa and Jonathan, right? So, you know, the conversations we've had there, that's usually what people will, will say. And so it's either themselves, you know, which is lovely to see, but oftentimes then it might be a family member that will kind of so, sort of kickstart that. Which is interesting because then people sit there and, and truthfully are suffering alone. Yeah. Right. Because yeah. we're not asking yeah. for help. Yeah. But how does one ask for help? What do you guys expect? Like, or what would you guys suggest when they want to ask for help? So when you're in people's homes, they're usually more open to having a conversation because they feel more comfortable. And the biggest thing for us is this is a stranger coming in your home. So you have to build that sense of trust. Um, but usually the people that really want help, they're the first ones to say, just tell you their whole experience, like nonchalantly. And um, I always ask them when they do tell me that, like, especially with mental health, loneliness, um, or depression, especially if they're living at home and their family lives far, they're the first ones to say, like, I always ask them, are you open to help? Right. Because some people are like, nope, I don't want it. Like, it's not something I want. Um, and it's a really shut down conversation where I try to open it up and sometimes it's kind of deviated. But when people there's a lot of people that do actually want the help and asking the giving them that opportunity to say, yeah, I do. I've noticed has been very helpful. So I always ask that question and um, it's always been successful to say, what are, what, what can I do? Right. Cause a lot of people feel hopeless too. They don't know what's out there. And that's why OpiLife is a huge thing for us to start because a lot of people don't know their tools that they can use. It can be as simple as like doing some coloring to having a companion come in your home or just having like a clean space because they can't physically clean anymore. Right. So there was a, there's two things that I want to bring up is I want to kind of go back to the family side of things because yeah. the family itself, whether it's the children or their children, mm -hmm. um, they either become very selfish for their own interests or they become very helpful. But that's where I go back where the true colors come out. Right. But we don't really appreciate what the family goes through in this situation depending on how many children there are, right? So there is a lot of stress, a lot of mental mm -hmm. um, anxiety, all kinds of stuff happening there, right? Mm -hmm. And I wanted to get some insight on how do you guys handle that? Because now you've got, you're coming in to help an individual, but you have to kind of get the lay of the land on um, the, the siblings, the kids. Mm -hmm. And I'll bring up a scenario without sharing too much personally, is that when we started bringing somebody in to help, they weren't culturally right. And mm -hmm. when I say that, and I started explaining certain things. I said to my siblings, get a fucking Portuguese person. Yeah. That's going to be helpful. Yeah. Right. And that's exactly the next step that happened. And it became more relevant to the person. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's what I mean. It's like you can't just go in there and all of a sudden bring somebody in that's very good at home care and health care of this individual. Yep. They have to somehow connect with them where they were raised. So you got to almost go back in history and understand what this person was like as a European or whatever culture it is, and then connect with them that level instead of trying to show them new games or new opportunities or go outside and plan something and stuff like that. So one thing, it, you know, w within my line of work, and, and I've gone in to do sort of like home care for physio specifically, but even to a, a larger part, even outside of like medical health or, or whatnot, is that the ability to connect with people. It's, it's a paramount, absolutely paramount. Um, because if you don't have that, you can't go beyond helping someone. It right? has to be a genuine connection yeah, too. Yeah, you, yeah. Can't, you can't, can't right? fake it. So yeah. one of the, the most important things for myself when I work, I can only speak for myself, is that when I'm working with someone, my job is to connect, but I'm always going to be consistently authentic. That's it. Like I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm here to understand you, learn about you, because that's the only way I can connect with you, right? Um, and then once you establish that, then can you then slowly start to learn more about the person? They will feel comfortable. They will open up. And you're not only helping them, you know, and, and it goes with Selena as well. For me, like, yes, it's physio, the physical nature of it. But when I'm treating someone, I'm not just treating like an ankle or a knee. You treat the person, right? And so, and I always make the joke in, um, in clinic is that I use the second half of my title more than the first half, therapist. 
right? Because I'm managing the individual, you know, trying to help them, guide them, coach them, whatever it may be, but I need to connect, right? And so, so much to what you said, right, is that they need to feel comfortable and you need to connect. And now with an age, like we were saying, where everyone's addicted to their phone, you know, we're more, the most accessible we've ever been, but the most disconnected. And it's a skill that we're slowly starting to lose. So what do you do to connect with people the most? For me, it's, it's I'm like a genuine curiosity. Like when I have someone in clinic, like I want to learn about this person. Like authentically speaking, I'm not trying to do it as a gimmick or a gag that, hey, no, like, you know, what is it that you're interested in? And for me, I'm always curious about so many things so that I can connect with someone on a different level. Like someone's into F1, someone's into a unique hobby or someone culturally is from this place in the world, right? That, hey, I've been to or I have good friends that are a part of that world. So then you become this social chameleon to a degree, right? And, and that's a very important skill set. Um, but you, you need to be curious so you can connect. Because mm -hmm. if you don't have this curiosity, you're just going to stay within a finite limitation of what you're exposed to, then how can you connect to anyone beyond that? And you can't. Yeah. Um, am I fair to say that in Europe, there's less of an issue with this than here in North America? Because I think Canada and the U.S. is very similar. When I say home in care terms, and therapy, yeah. physio, is it less there? Like in terms of the need? Yeah. Um, in, ter in terms of the growth of the, of industry, the industry, right? Because of the amount of people that are needing this. Well, I think like I can only speak on like the European culture because uh, I've we've been there for we, I've been visiting there and I have my family that's from there as well. They're very community based, so they help each other. Mm -hmm. Right. So they don't need as much home care. And there's even some families that I went to in their homes where they have a they have quite a big home where they have multiple families in there and they're helping each other. Right. So they don't need home care. So I always say if you can do it, like just like in the European culture, if you can help each other, help it. It will save you money and it'll also help you connect as a family. Um, obviously, there's concerns with uh, having the understanding and the competency of what to do in certain situations, like how to bathe them properly, safety equipment, um, and how to stay safe in your home and comfortable. Uh, but I do see, like to answer your question, Manny, there, it is a lot less because the culture is a bit different, right? And it's, it's a lot more on the, the family as a, a support, and they have that sense of dignity of helping their family culturally, uh, where they don't need that external support. Can we get gender? And I'm just going to make an assumption that men are more stubborn than women when it comes to want or, uh, I guess, obtaining this care. Uh, like I'll, I'll say for, yeah, go. for, uh, for us, it's, it's the same both ways. Really? Yeah. It's, yeah, it's the same both ways. Um, we actually have more male clients than female clients. Um, but they're at the more advanced stage where the family makes a decision. Um, okay. So uh, a lot of the, who comes to us for help is usually the daughters. Um, and they're the ones that have been managing the care for so long. And they're getting now exhausted having this experience of burnout. Um, and they're usually the ones that are the power of attorney. So they're making the decisions for them. And they're not, they, they can't do it anymore. So they come to us. Uh, but again, like it's hard to say because a lot of the males in our clientele are the ones that the daughters are making the decision. Uh, but the females are just like when I go into people's homes and they don't have any cognitive issues, it's still a, we, we deal with primarily Italians. And uh, because we're in the Woodbridge, we primarily do the mm -hmm. Woodbridge area or Vaughn. Um, both, both the females and the males have the sense of dignity with doing things themselves and not giving that up. And it's a misconception about our, what we do is like, we're going to do it for them. We're not going to do it for them. Right. Like there is a, a you're, I know yeah, your face. I, I get it. No, I know. <laughs> it's more of like my no, no, for example, um, he, he likes to do gardening. Right. And we're not like, I constantly work. My dad constantly works and a, we're, we're not always available, but he still wants to garden. And it's important for him. And we don't want to take that away from him. But we have this concern that he's going to fall and that nobody's there. Um, or that he can't get up and what is he going to do? Because his phone's like two meters down at uh, where, where he first started. Like it's, it's so, so when we talked to him, it was more like you could still do that stuff. But if there is those circumstances where you need help getting up or um, just make sure you're safe, like ha having some sort of guidance down the stairs when you're going down. We don't have to take that away from you because just like Alberto was saying, once you take it away, it's, it's gone, yeah. right? If you don't use it, you lose it as yeah. the common yeah. cliche. But 
And we don't want to do that. And that's what the misconception about home care is like to your question, is it preventative? It, it is to a certain extent where we can, if like fall prevention is a huge thing in home care. So we prevent falls for seniors because once they fall, they, it can be like 85% usually get injured. And when there's an injury, it's, yeah. it's impaired. It, gets, right? it cascades to like, you know, exactly. lower mobility, then that's going to accentuate all their like underlying health related issues. Right. And, so, and they're older. It's yeah. so much harder to repair. So we always tell people before you fall, like don't wait for a fall. If you're having like shuffling of the feet, you're holding furniture to walk. That's maybe an indicator of either a family can help you have somebody there that lives with you or getting an external help like from OpiLife or another home care company. How can an older person, I guess, strength train? To do little things the around person. the house. And I'm not talking start yeah. pumping iron and no, no, yeah. these in, certain people. In, in honestly, people don't need a gym um, no. to, yeah. to sort of regain or, or keep what they is required for their everyday life, right? And it's, as I always tell people, is that it, it's, we really sort of break everything down into these abstract um, exercises to then establish these prerequisites of what is required in your everyday life, right? So what are the specific nuances of what going up and down stairs are, right? Well, to be honest with you, not to get overly technical, but it's a single leg squat. Think about it. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Right. So if you can't do a partial leg, single leg squat, right. And now there's nuance to going down or up, right. A quad dominant movement mechanic versus a glute dominant, right. One's more challenging than the other. If we don't have these small little things, it's basically trying to graduate, you know, high school, but you've only done grade three. Right. So let's fill in these gaps, right. Establish these prerequisites and, you know, to, to go up and downstairs, you don't need iron, right? Your body weight in a progressive manner will get you there. Here's one for you, because I started doing this like a year or two ago. Um, I challenge anybody who's listening right now, try to do a squat blindfold. That'd be fun. See what happens. I have, a, I have, I have, a, I have more of a, a fun one, because I see it all the time, people who can squat 405 pounds, and I'll ask them, hey, do a single leg body weight squat. Mm -hmm. And they can't. Mm -hmm. They cannot. Right? And, it's and these so are little things that you can do that will actually benefit you later yeah. on because when you have a little slight adjustment where you lose balance or something like that, by that doing that little training there, it will help you recover yeah. preventing a fall. And there's so many detailed things that, uh, you know, and these are conversations, you know, I, I have in clinic all the time is that we just take for granted, right? You know, going up or downstairs, like we don't, you don't really know what's involved with that, right? And so unless we go through it and we break it down, and I don't really go too far into it, right? Because then it's just a bit of a boring chat, right? But to take it for granted is where people have this misconception where like, but it's just going up or downstairs or it's just walking. It is, you can't look at it that way. Yeah, right? right? Like when I tell people like when you're walking, right? Like if I like, you know, for example, now if I have someone who has... Um, an Achilles rupture, I have quite a few of them on my caseload at the moment, is that, hey, why can't I still walk? And I'm like, well, here's why. When you're walking, you, you have to push off your body weight on one leg, like a calf raise. You can't do that yet. We're not there yet. So to have this expectation that I should be walking because of time, that's another favorite question of mine, is like, well, how long is it going to take? My job is to make sure it takes the minimum amount of time as possible. But there are so many things that you can do that can turn this sideways. Right. Physically, when does the body start to turn where it's like, I joke, listen, in a few years, I'm probably going to start having to get tested to do driving. Yeah. Right. Like because you get to a certain age where they're going to start testing you whether or not because your insurance goes down the older you get. But yeah. then it starts to go back up the older you get. Mm -hmm. So at what point in your physical body does it start to turn where it doesn't like when I was younger, I would cut myself heal like Wolverine yeah. right away. Yeah. Yeah. Doesn't happen anymore. Like, it takes a while for the healing, right? Yeah. There's never, like, a, a specific age, right? Because th there's so many things that go into it. It's never just, like, a, a singular one thing or, like, a singular age, right? You know, it's, it's why you see someone who can be 30, but they, they might look like they're 40. But then we marvel at someone who could be 40 and, that, wow, you look like you're 30, yeah. right? So it, it's how well you take care of yourself in an entire capacity, right, of every element of health that will then either shift it to a later date or even earlier right um but again if you if you're going based off of just health and healing and stuff like that there, there it's more than just one question you're asking right yeah and so you know there's a physical element there's a medical element right there's a physiological element and so each one is different and but then a lot of the same things that contribute to that 
or it's 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 one big interplay. I always said start the earliest you can. Yeah. Right. Just if start. that's exercise, uh, healthy eating, even just getting some fresh air, managing yeah. stress, like all of those affect your health, and they do cascade and increase or exacerbate your aging the aging process, especially stress. Like in our society, stress is so high that we're seeing it's affecting cardiac. It's affecting people's lifestyle and their well-being, right? So, and a lot of our clients that are in their older, in their 90s, and they're actually quite healthy, they've always been exercising since they were young. They have not smoked. Um, they have a lot of social support. They love people and they interact with their community. And that's wonderful to see. It's just now it's you're seeing less and less of it. So the quality of life is less and less. But this is that proactive approach, right? Yeah. Mm. This yeah. is proactivity that we, we see it because, you know, we're in industries that arguably, if proactivity was more, more relevant, industries might not be as dominant as they are. And that's the thing. Like, no one really talks about it. Yeah. No one does. Mm. Like, especially in terms of aging. They don't want the answer? <laughs> uh, I think it's just a very difficult d- topic to have. So like I always, when I ha- we have clients that come in and they're in their 60s, I always ask them, have you thought about like what your end of life would be like? Mm. And everybody, like I, it's always such a hard topic because it's a trust thing, but everyone's just like, they kind of just go, they, fro- they freeze. It's like, I've never thought of that. And I know it's such a hard topic because no one wants to think of dying, but it's, it's something that needs to be considered because we have families that I ask them, it's like their family member is not able to make decisions anymore. So the, the, their, like their daughter, for example, is the one they're making decisions. And I always ask, what would your, what would your father would have wanted? Right. And they're like, we never had that discussion. Mm. So they're in that, and that causes a lot of stress for them. And to, to your point about being individualistic and not, and um, not being able, like what I'm trying to say, not so that's like that selfish part of them usually i see in family members when they're selfish is because they don't know what to do so they're kind of being there's a lot of self-interest going on right there's a lot of it but a lot of like there's a lot of variables that go into it um because we've seen abuse before financially unfortunately uh where they're making decisions because they want the inheritance and that's a hard thing to address but a lot of it is because they've already have stress in their life through their own life. And then this is adding a lot of barriers and or a lot of challenges to them. And they don't know how to respond. And then they become, everybody likes to withdraw when they don't know what to do. So how taxing is it for you guys? Because I'm starting to notice this as well. For the person, mentally speaking, to try to connect with the past. And when I say that, when I was a younger man, I could do far more physically, carry, lift, work, ride, run, whatever. But then as you get older, shit, man, I used to be able to carry a lot more. How much does that start to weigh on you mentally? And I I guess as as you start losing certain functions mentally speaking as well, how much do they revert back to the past and go, I remember when I was a young person Mm. and I remember doing this and I remember doing all these things and now you can't do it. Does that really take a huge toll on the person? I I get that sentiment a lot in clinic where I'd be like, someone, we're, we're working through something like, well, I, I used to do like this train for three hours and six days a week and this and that. And I'm like, yes, it's because we're fixated in the past, right? And it, it's a skill to just be present, right? And sort of yeah. disassociate the two, right? And focus on, on now, in, in the present versus living in the past, right? And it's not to say that you can't do that. You just have to adjust, right? And so the moment we can accept that, oh, life's so much easier, <laughs> right? It, you know, it's if, hard to accept it, though. But then that's your ego. Why? Oh, 100%. Yeah, yeah pride and just ego are probably the biggest I, barriers I, I, I say to check the ego in the front door. Like, there's no, there's no need. There's no need. Because you're just going to then hurt yourself. Literally. So... Do you see it as well, Selena? Like, I, I, I can only assume that you do that. Sometimes memories are brought up that yeah. they m- probably remember vividly. Like, they're like they're so specific. They almost could just paint a picture. And you're like, I don't understand. You don't remember last week. You don't remember this morning. But then you're telling me about this situation that happened years, decades ago. With people with n- not having any cognitive issues, it's definitely stuff that comes up, especially when they went through an injury or they had a fall or they had a surgery. And they're like, well, I wasn't, I'm not able to do this anymore. And they have this, it's like a mourning stage where they're 
some people are like, nope. I'm fine and they'll do it and they'll end up injuring themselves because that sense of pride that they that's something that they've they put so much importance towards like being able to make your own meals in the Italian culture food is like the biggest thing so when you can't make your meals anymore because you've had a fall and you've broken your wrists and now you can't move as much um that's that's like really hurtful for them so they kind of have to yes it's like you have to mourn the fact that you're losing that, but you also have to put your pride aside. Like Alberto saying, say, hey, like I do need this help. Like, I, this is important to me. I, I need to get some rehabilitation, some support to help me get there. But because people have such denial in the from the beginning because of that pride and ego, um, which again, it's, it's easier said than done, but because they have such denial, they're going through that morning, that morning stage of denial and they don't move on to the next or go through that fluid motion. They end up sitting there and they lose that ability. And then it just tr- keeps trickling. Cause once you say you start not making meals anymore, that means you're maybe sitting on the couch or emotionally. Now you are be you're feeling some sort of depressive state and now you're socially isolating yourself. And now we're in this cyclic, um, in this motion where now you've only made yourself worse and it's it's so unfortunate but you see it so commonly just because they it's you can't ask for help right or you don't see the need to ask for help because of just that denial and i usually see it to to kind of maybe speak a bit more specifically to your audience like i got a lot of laborers in construction and especially with the men is that they don't come in until it's like too late. Oh problem. yeah, that's yeah. that's they, so common. Yeah, it's so. Or common. when something happens, yeah. then it's like yeah, okay. it has to be like <laughs> literally like yeah. like I'm, my life is so impacted, right? And you know, coming sort of talking to what Selena was saying is that a lot of what you know in, in with pain science that we know is that pain is biopsychosocial. Yep. Right. So, right. You know, to let's say a labor, right. Well, my ankle, it's really bad now because I've, you know, denial, like, hey, I can just grind through it. I'm going to be tough. It's not a problem. I'm going to keep going, keep going up until the point they can't. Now they're not working. If they're the sole provider for their their household, well, that's going to amplify, right? Hey, they can't work. That's going to be even further amplified. They have two, three kids, right? Money was already tight from the get-go. And so now you have all of these social elements and then these psychological elements that come on top, right? That it's why I say that, a lot of the times I'm, I'm, I'm talking to the person and the physical stuff is the easiest part, right? Like that, that's relatively predictable for a large degree, you know, not always, but I'm having to work with the individual more so on that side of things than, than everything else. And oftentimes, you know, we were talking like genders between men and women is that I, I always kind of find it funny is that I never typically see the man. I'll usually see the, the wife first and then she'll bring the husband in after. Right. This is an old school culture. That's yeah. all it is. Yeah. And it, it's, you know, like I can understand it and I appreciate it, right? But it's, it's, it's going to be so much easier having someone ask for help earlier, right? Because now you're not having to sort of climb, you know, this sort of metaphorical hold that you've gotten so far down in, right? One, you, it'll be financially easier because we're not having to climb back from something that's so detrimental, right? So the earlier we ask for help, the better. It becomes part of your routine as well, yeah. right? It's a proactive yeah. routine. Somebody comes in for... Uh, you know, my, my situation was simple. I went in for a finger, met you, you know, helped the finger. And it was like, oh, by the way, yep. let's take a proactive approach to this and this, right? And because then it's like you're dealing with it the, uh, at the other end and you as well. It's, it's that cognitive awareness. It, it's not easy to sit on, to talk about it and say, well, uh-huh. I was mm-hmm. once cooking and now I'm sitting on a couch. That person has to process that, but then so does the family. Uh-huh. And they don't yeah. have to deal with it. Yep. Well, you know, my mom is now just couch, uh, you know, stuck or whatever it is right and it, i always say it's like it's better to focus and, and fixate on like the, the steps and the plan of action right because if you just sit there and, and dwell on like well i used to do this and i used to do that and i can't do any of it and you go through all these psychological phases but it's like right you can go down a very dark place with it psychologically it's a right bad rabbit hole yeah. yeah and so right let's let's fixate on like what are we going to do right what are these small incremental steps so let's look for these small, consistent progressions, right? In whatever facet it is. I think, yeah, you just have it's to hard. Be, you have to be open. Yeah. And I think that's like the biggest source of advice to people is I think there's a lot of misconceptions with a lot of the services that are there to help you and just yeah. asking for help. Um, but sometimes you just have to just throw yourself out there and say, like, I'm going to try it. If it doesn't work, like if physio yeah. doesn't work or home care doesn't work, at least you tried. And there's different things that you can do. But it, you, but a lot of people have this mentality where 
it's like, nope, it's not, it's not for me. I'm not doing it, mm -hmm. especially with home care. Like I go yeah. into homes and it's like the family wants it, but the, 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 the father doesn't want it. And I'm just like, okay, I give it a try. Like we'll start with like three visits, um, see if it works. Nope. I don't want it. Right. And then I have, a, I, we had a case where the family member ended up calling me. It's like my dad fell and now he's stuck in bed and now he, but he wants to stay home. Uh, but we need help with the care in the bed. So it's, it's, uh, yeah. I think to like, to what you're saying is that there's this fear of vulnerability, right? Like, yeah, that's right? true. And it's, mm -hmm. and it, it, everyone, we, we always want to feel good, right? We always want to feel safe. We always want to feel complacent, right? I, I kind of have this sort of rhetoric where like, we have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Like you can't always be comfortable. Like that's not life, right? Like we're always going to have or face some form of, challenge or, or stress in life like that's life right like that's real we're not always going to be sunshine and rainbows that's that's a very unrealistic expectation and that's only going to set us up for even more of a catastrophic sort of mental you know um stress right and we just need to be able to tolerate that and understand that and something i always say too is that when you're flying on a plane do you feel how fast you're going no what do you really feel when you're on a plane you just feel the change of pace Mm -hmm. That's it, right? So li life is like that. You're going to have these changes of paces, right? And so the moment we can be vulnerable and open to that and sort of understand that, be comfortable with it, which is massively difficult, I understand, right? Like that is very, very difficult. But the moment we can do that, it, it really makes things so easy, right? So, you know, kind of like what me and Jonathan were talking about, like what's our mindset, right? Let's, let's approach that. Let's analyze our mindset. Because if we keep analyzing things with, this, with the same mindset, you're going to see the same thing, right? So, But at a certain age, you get to a certain point where it's like, listen, I've done everything I'm going to achieve, and I think I'm just going to ride this out for the rest of my days. Yeah, I Is love that it. not the norm? Like, that's what we see? So I think there's a deeper thing to what you're saying. And, and so it's a, lot of, it's a lot what I see in clinic, right? And it's, yes, physically, but more philosophically speaking, is why do we argue so much for our limitations? Why? That's a good point. Mm. Right? Like, why can't what, it be the beginning of something? Yeah, why? Like, right? con, like that curiosity, why? Ask why. Why not? Right? Like, listen, it's, and it's not for everyone. I know that's not the mindset everyone's going to have, right? But the more we can have a little bit, instill a little bit of that into anyone or everyone, it, it'll be much more lovely. What do you guys recommend for people to have, I guess, I mean, the go-to is the physical exercise. We already know, just be yeah. active and just move. doesn't matter what age you are, just be active and, mm -hmm. and move. But the mental exercises, what can a person do, I guess, in their 40s and 50s, if there is this history in the family? Like, like when, when my situation was happening, uh, certain siblings were already only discussing what was potentially going to happen to them as a result of this because all of the older person's siblings all went through the exact same thing. So it was inevitable that that person is going to go through it as well. Because yeah, so you're saying genetically, right? Exactly, like right? The genetic so they're component? just on a path that, okay, well, they're not eating well and they're not exercising and they're just full of anxiety and mental and they're just seeing mm -hmm. um, the future. They're seeing their future possibility. But what can we do? Because we can do something. Can't we mentally prepare ourselves to possibly avoid it or prolong, like push it off? And I think having those, like like you mentioned, the healthy eating exercise, like again, starting always early, but also just continuously stimulating yourself. So if that's through social interactions like we're having today, through friends, mm -hmm. through going to uh, the community center and doing some puzzles, coloring. Cheating like, on Scrabble? Or mm -hmm. yeah. I cheat on Scrabble every single time. <laughs> you ain't cheating, you ain't trying, right? I keep the track. Uh, that's how I cheat. Uh, so it doesn't matter, I always win, right? But even in cheating, it takes mental capacity, that's right? That's what I mean. Yeah. So like a lot I'll of cheat into my old golden years, right? <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, you know what? Like just stay like, having those. Like I always tell people, even like coloring within the lines, mm. it takes some mental capacity. Or doing a puzzle, or doing like um, what are they called when Sudoku? Oh yeah, right. Oh, okay, like, yeah. You'll see them in retirement homes because it takes a lot of mental capacity. And again, if you don't use it, you lose it. Yeah. So not just throwing yourself in front of a screen and not actively thinking about it. Um, Nobody and just doing things ball past. Ball. I do in clinic all the no, time. No, actually, like, <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. We, like ask Jonathan. Like, at, really? Yeah, honestly. At the Chancellor community. But can you do, because I mean, I'm yeah. just concerned if you're 
at that mental state of older, you really want to give these balls to certain individuals? It really depends on the behavioral okay, aspect right. of people. Um, if they're obviously on the more aggressive end, you do have to be careful as to what you're giving them, especially even if it's like something as simple as cutlery. Okay. So, um, and I've been, I've been in those circumstances as a nurse where you give them a knife and they, and there's some behavioral issues. I'm just trying so, to think of what things that we can do like that could be helpful because I think it's also going to be helpful for the family. Yeah. 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 It's just cognitive stimulation. Like, yeah. like Selena said, right. There's a cognitive loading. Like, so I know we talk about the physical realm of like, you know, exercise and whatnot, but there's a cognitive element to it as well. Right. Like when we have concussion athletes, right. It, th well now it's, cognitive exercise right that's a bit in you know specific and i think a bit too much for an elderly population right but like like i said coloring games cards cards is great cards the, yeah a lot of memory going on with that right you have to remember what's played and if you know depending how competitive someone gets right you'll end up playing their hand so you can try to you know win right um but things like that and it doesn't have to be glamorous like it doesn't you know same thing with the physical stuff it doesn't you don't need a gym it, you don't need these stretching. And what I tell people too is if there's things that you love, do, do it, it yeah. right? Because that's more of a likelihood that you're going to keep it consistent. You're not going to try to change something at 60 or 70 years old. People don't usually like change. And you're going through a lot of change in your life anyways, if that's the aging process um, or a family member dying, which unfortunately we all go through. But if there's something like, uh, like the Italians love the Italian cards, like Scopa, if that's what you like, do it. Right. It's better than nothing. But a lot of people think they have to do like these complex things. Well, you don't. You don't. A lot of people already know what they have to do. Mm -hmm. and, and cognitively, it can be something as just playing cards or doing puzzles. Um, I don't know what uh, people usually like to do that they could continue doing. But I always say to um, like younger people, like around our age, is staying active and, and eating healthy. Like that's the perfect start because that's where it all originates from. And the earlier you start, the better. And one element to it too is like you know on a social element of health is that when we I see it a lot in clinic with kids is that the kids that have social circles or extracurriculars that separates them from school, right? That is just even more beneficial for them, right? And so it, you create a new social circle, right? Where you you be able to have a bit more of an outreach, right? Um, and they become friends for life, and it's just another paramount level where it's it just goes so undervalued that when it's just with school, it, they're very confined and that their social network in school becomes everything to them. Whereas if they have another outlet, it, it's that they become more independent. I want to ask you guys a question and including you too, Jonathan, and we can keep this in the show or not. It's up to you guys, how you guys want to address it. But your thoughts on if there's a lot of families asking about maid. It's a good question. Um, I'm just assuming these days that, there are a lot more families asking about it. And and for anybody who's not familiar, I guess, listening outside of Canada, just assisted suicide, right? Yeah, yeah medical just, assistance and dying. Yeah, so it just like, uh, I have my thoughts on it, and I just don't like where the government's going with it. Um, but I don't know if you guys want to discuss if there's been family members that have, like, listen, my parent is getting to a certain point where I don't want to see this anymore. I just don't want to be around it anymore. Is there another option? And then all of a sudden this conversation about maid comes up, right? Yeah. yeah. Is that coming up? I think in, for people that are at the end of life, it is a discussion. Um, it's usually the last resource. People don't jump to it in the discussions when they come to me and talk about it. Um, it's a very hard thing to bring up. So sometimes I'm not like in the home care sector. We're not at that stage to bring it up. Um, but is it more discussed? Yes. Is it more socially acceptable? Yes. But is it something that people are jumping to? No. Um, sorry, what was your question? No, I just wanted to get your thoughts. Yeah. Um, I don't know exactly what's going on in terms of the eligibility, especially around mental health. But from my experience in home care, um, it's been a beautiful thing. And I've been part of situations where people have decided to do that and they have went through the process. And it is a lengthy process. Um, and they do a lot of screening about it especially if there's like any suspect of financial abuse related to it, it's not going through. And a lot of people, a lot of families and even the individual before they pass, they are in acceptance of one of death and two, they want that quality of life and that dignity that is surrounded by being with family and having that ability to make their own decision and control. 
So although it is a sad, like when I was, when I, when I had, I'm just thinking of the last time I was part of a family member that was doing it, like a client mm-hmm. that we had, um, the family was obviously it was a sad moment, but they were very happy to know that their family member passed without having that sort of suffering. So it is like, I know it's, uh, it's not something that people like to discuss, but it is, it's great to have it as an option because at least you can have that discussion with the family. Do I think it needs to be highly regulated? Yes, because it can be abused, especially with the, like, the self, um, having like thinking of it from a self perspective or taking advantage of it. Yeah. Um, so it has to be highly regulated. And I don't know what's happening now with how open it is, but it, it's definitely something that can be beautiful if it's not abused. Yeah, I, I've only had limited experience with it when I was in physio school. Obviously, we have to go through different rotations, and one of which being the ICU, a respiratory care unit. And mm-hmm. there was a few um, encounters with it. There was two, and to be specific. Um, and, and much to what Selena said, I think she really hit the nail on the head there, um, pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, it's, it's just it has to be – it's very circumstantial, right? Because yeah. – I think that has to be the sort of forefront of it in, in sort of when we discuss it is that it's very circumstantial, right? And every family, every circumstance on the medical side and the family dynamics will be different. And it is obviously it, it has to be rigorous and it has to be a process and it just has to be a conversation. And does is it something where it seems like it's a better option or is it sort of obviously not, right? And the two that I can recall, like, the, the family were much in support of it. It was very unanimous. And much like Selena said, it was like, it was more of like relief and they were happy with it. Right. And, and that might not necessarily be agreed with some people. They might have another perspective of it. Right. And so it's just, I think the moment we can accept, Hey, there's difference of opinions with it. And it, and I think it's pretty easy to sort of mm. have that conversation. Interesting. I think it's easy to say that it is bad when you're not in the experience, yeah. right? Like they, when you are palliative having stage four, so the stage four cancer and it's all over your body and you see people in the hospital, like it makes me, it makes me a little bit emotional because of the suffering that Mm -hmm. they go through. They're on like so much pain medications. And it's, it decreases their quality of life to the point where they can't do anything and they feel this lot lack of purpose. And it's not anything that we can do. Like even as a healthcare provider, it hurts me because I can't do anything. So I feel hopeless for them and you want to help, yeah. but they, you can't. Right. And they, it's to, they feel like the individual and I've spoken to people that I've de- like that were in thinking about it when I was a nurse at the bedside is they want to keep that sense of dignity and they want to have that respect for themselves and they don't want to go through this suffering. That was part of their wishes in the first place. I don't want to suffer like this. It's very debilitating. It's it's a terrible memory to have. I don't want to go like this. So that or I don't want to continue like this anymore. And it's it's a hard obviously it's a hard discussion and I'm making it seem a lot easier than it is, but it's an no, it's very, very difficult. It's a, it's Extremely it's very difficult. challenging, but to have the option for individuals that are going through such circumstances, it's one yeah, it has to be vigorous, but two it, it, again, it can be a very beautiful thing if it's yeah if it's used under the correct circumstances. Do you have any thoughts, John? Yeah, thank you for sharing that, guys. And <clears throat> you struck a lot of nerves. Now, context is I haven't yet had this experience, and hopefully I don't, I don't have to, but who's, who's to say that it doesn't happen? Um, you know, what shows up for me as you're talking is, I share this vulnerably, like it's almost like an outer body experience as you're talking. I'm saying, I was fast forwarding to my mind, saying, holy smokes, if that's me at the end of life, what goes through my mind? And here's what showed up. It was like, if I, for me, if I'm whole and complete at that stage in life where I can look at it and say, you know, to, to our children, I did everything I asked to do, and I've accomplished that, and I'm here for you. And if I can do, so, you know, I believe in the afterlife, and I believe in being of service. If I can leave on those terms and still be able to um, physiologically say to myself, give somebody else the organs that are still useful to somebody else before I get too far along. Um, I think it's, a, you know, all that to say is that I think it's a very unique conversation. Mm-hmm. And if we have the proactive approach that we talked about earlier along the way in our 50s, 60s, 70s, at that stage in life, it's not as um, confronting. 
Mm. It's almost an open. It's not right nor wrong. It's simply it's a tug of war and a conversation to say what happens here, or why do I want to go on a certain way? Mm. I s- I've seen it where people are suffering and it sucks. It sucks, and I've also seen the opposite end where people go peacefully, and it's never easy. Never That's easy. the thing. Ra- those conversations are never easy, right? If but it's I made think you or should not. have those conversations. I think if your parents, let's say your parents are in your fifties. Yeah. I think if you're listening, I think you have these conversations now. Whether you yes, have the conversation, exactly. I don't think you should have the conversation over a family get together. I think it should be a one on one with the individual. Probably do it separately if you've got both your parents still around. Um, I think you as an individual, whether in your late 20s, early 30s, and you've got a parent that's in their 50s, mid 50s, late 50s, bring it up. Discuss it. Because we never it's, did. Yeah. It's a very vulnerable yeah. conversation. Yeah. So yeah. you have to have people around you that you trust. And that are willing to but support you. But you'll get you. very honest uh, response. Yeah. And real fast, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> and I've seen it where, like, you don't get a chance to have that conversation. And now you're dealt with a scenario. And now you don't know. And you don't know. Especially when you're exactly. under the stress, yeah. too. It's, yeah. it's a total different circumstance. Like, where, if, where you have to make these decisions, especially very quickly in the hospitals. And... Because you're like, I know what he functions well. No, your brain's not functioning, yeah. right? No, and you're you, just taking a, you're taking opinions from everywhere, right? Yeah. Exactly. So when you have those discussions early, you're able to sit on it and also have that acceptance around it. Um, but it, again, like it has to be with people that are supporting you and trusting you, but also the people that are going to make the decisions for you. Like, do not leave out the person yeah. that you're saying in your will to make the decision, and yeah. now they don't even have they're not part of that discussion, right? You have to. Um, you have to include them in the discussion and then you also have to get like lawyers involved and everything, but just, just start, start having it now. And I, even with my family now at like my age, I always said to my family, I want, I want to be, I want to leave peacefully, whatever that means. And obviously there's details around it, not to share too much information, but even at my age, it's, it's a conversation that's worth having because you never know what's going to happen in life. And to your point is that like, well, you know, if it happens to someone, you know, let's say if it's to a father and the, the kid is having to do it. Well, you, unless you have that conversation, do you know what how they want to go? No. You will never. You'll, you'll never just know. assume. Exactly. And you're blinded and probably confused by, I think, the transition from what I remember that parent being, what yeah. I grew up with, yeah. what I always known about mm-hmm. that person, compared to what's in front of me right now, is very fog-like. Yep. And it's hard for you to kind of just make a very um, good decision on which side you think your parent was really going to be on. And that's where I start going back at the beginning of the show where I start talking about siblings start becoming selfish and they start thinking what's in their, their best interest. Because they project yeah. themselves. Exactly. Down. Because the fir- their, their first thought is this is definitely what they want. The second thought is what's going to happen to me when I'm at that age. Mm-hmm. So I, hopefully someone will be up to bat for me or whatever but but, but it is under like stressful circumstances 100%. extreme st- stressful stressful circumstances we default to being selfish it's a fight or flight response right so when i you have these conversations and like the whole lawyer thing is getting it written down because also when you're under stress you don't have your memory is impaired mm-hmm. so at least if you have it written down at least you can go back take a minute obviously to decompress but also take a minute to look at it and re- recall what your family member wanted. Because it's going to, you don't know if you have the discussion now and it happens in 40 years, you're not going to remember. Um, maybe that conversation has also changed. So it is also a consistent conversation. Um, It'll make it easier to have a second conversation with the same parent. Yeah. Yeah. Probably in five years, maybe 10 yeah. years. To the point where it's like, just shut up. Like, I mean, we and already talked about this. I'm perfectly fine right now. <laughs> Can you stop bringing this up? I just want to make sure that the answers are still the same. That's all exactly. I'm trying to make, right? It's, it's a consistent conversation, and it's something that needs to be de- destigmatized. Yeah. Uh, because it's part of life, and it's inevitable, unfortunately. Part of family. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yes. And I think that yeah. people take the family part out of the life part. It's like I always say to families, sorry. No, no, go, go, go. I always say to part, part of families, try to make something that's somebody very, something very difficult a little bit easier, mm. right? And ha- having those conversations early, consistently, have, not thinking it's a bad thing, but something that could be, that can be a, a beautiful thing in terms of lack of stress or wanting, doing exactly what they wanted, can, it should be, it should be an easier conversation in that sense. I've seen things go pr- pretty sideways where, you know, it'll be a parent and let's say there's three siblings. 
and the word you said that I don't even think you realize like how imperative it is, is that consistency, yeah. right? Wherein is the conversation with the parent and each sibling the same, right? All that, yeah. And so I've seen it where True. it's not the same. And then now it just creates this big ordeal within a family, right? And it's like, well, no, they told me this, it's this. And yeah. it gets very messy really quickly and it gets really ugly. And then you're getting argumentative, combative and, now the, the person that you're ultimately trying to care for is just has fallen off and now you're all trying to fight to be right. And all the energy is going towards making that decision instead yeah. of caring. Caring. Yeah. yeah. And again, our very challenging circumstance, yeah. even more challenging. But yeah. It is just as long as you have it up front and like yeah, I, I, I know to some degree, you know, with my dad, like I and I, I I I've had conversations where yeah, it's not not to go into too much detail, but like I have a vague idea. Right. Um. I don't know about you, Alberto, but when I had the conversation with my dad, he it's a it's a it's challenging, even though I'm a healthcare provider and I have these conversations constantly. Nope, I don't want to talk about it. Right. Death, it's like this whole it, it, again, it's also my dad's very um, I know, but bring up the question and just yeah. see how the body see. language is. Right. And then you get a sense of it and then yeah. bring it yeah. up again. Doesn't matter. It's old school European stubbornness. Uh. Just bring it up again. That's it. Just let it marinate. Drop it. And I, I, like and in my situation, I never got that chance with my dad because he passed young in his 50s. And then I never got a chance with my mom because she was so far gone as a result of it. Right. So it's like, I think if you had that conversation beforehand, it yeah. would have been a lot better now. And that's the thing. Like you bring it up, even if it's like a no first. Yeah. Right. And it's it's very there's you're feeling that resistance. Just keep bringing it up and it becomes more of a norm. Yep. of the conversation you're so gonna, it starts really to yeah you're gonna say something you're gonna sit there and it's gonna ferment over time and yeah you know, i love what you mentioned before was consistency and the evolution because you want to check in and have touch points along the way is your philosophy still the same way it once yeah. was or has it evolved right yeah. you're gonna say yeah you get a hard no or hard, hard i don't want to talk about it today yeah let's Let's bring it up back Try up tomorrow again. Yeah. yeah let's check Try it next week yeah. till eventually it's going to be like and they'll okay. be more open, right? Like, you know, like as we get older, we're, we're all going to have some form of medical thing, right? So like the first, let's just say for fun, the most common one typically is like hypertension, right? So like, okay, that's the first one. Now they're going to be a bit more open. Okay, right? Let, you know, when you ask, it might not be a hard no now, right? And so th they can kind of see, right, okay, this is kind of coming to the last, you know, the back half, if you will. And they'll be much more receptive to, to sort of have that dialogue versus like, no, no, don't worry about it, right? So I'm just writing down really extreme situations that they have to take care of. So then they'll have to do it because <laughs> it'll just haunt them, right? It'll haunt them at that point, right? So, yeah. like, I mean, I'm from Pico, which is from the Azores, which has got the highest point in Portugal, right? Yeah. So part of mine is something to do with getting on the top there. So whoever's going to be responsible for that is not going to be in very good shape to get up there. No. So we're both going to go at the same time, right? That's kind of, that's a whole other story. I don't <laughs> want to get into that. But um, I want to talk about regrets. Have regrets for people in general change over the times? Or because you see a lot of people talking when they speaking to elderly people that are in their last days or whatever, and you ask them about certain regrets, and a lot of the same answers are coming up. Is that still the case? You mean, sorry, repeat what that. What they regret in life, what they maybe didn't achieve, or what they would tell someone that's younger, like, don't sweat the small stuff. Like, don't worry about this shit. Just be kind. Just be nice to people. Try to be happy as often as you possibly can. Try to smile. People don't smile these days. No. Like, all these little really simple things. I'm just assuming when you get to that certain stage in life, simplicity and peace and just happiness and a, a sense of content is, like, paramount to them. It's huge. So I, I just don't know if regrets I, I have think changed. one one thing we have to realize is we have to choose our regrets, right? Like because every action or inaction is that's a choice. That's a, that's still an action, right? Um, from what I've seen, um, and it's very vague or or broad, but is that like you wanted? They want they were always wanting to do what they wanted to do for themselves, but never did. Um, so they kind of effectively lived a life, but then they'll project it onto the kids. Yeah. I'm not a parent, so I just, I see it. Yeah, exactly. So, like, they didn't live the life they wanted to, so they'll in induce it on, like, a kid or whatever. Or they're just very much have this underlying resentment, right? So it'll come out in, in conversation that they might be a bit more um, spicy is the word I like to use a lot, <laughs> right? You know, so, but I, I would say from what I've seen is more so that, um 
I'm trying to think. I think for, well, it depends on the demographic when I'm speaking to. So with seniors, like a lot in terms of home care is when we provide services, they have the sense of relief, right? And they get that support and comfort. And I all like every single client that comes on board, they always say, I wish I did this sooner. Mm. And I know you're rolling your eyes, yeah, but it I is, know. it's a sense of comfort. And because especially in your home, if there's mobility issues or if there is um, like, say they haven't done whatever they have because of the depressive states, they, they feel this sense of relief afterwards and they have this peace of mind, especially for the families too. Like the, the same comment comes for both. Um, but f- in terms of regrets, like Alberto, like what you said, um, I don't like framing it as a regret because it's a lived experience. And for them, and I always frame it that way to when we have these conversations, especially with our older uh, adults, is it's not really, they don't, f- it's never really framed as a regret because they always accept, like there's a part of acceptance to it. But is there something that they wish they did differently? Yes. And a lot of the time it's just the general um advice that they usually give is just take that leap in terms of risks. So if that is something as simple as asking that girl out or doing your, your business. And I always got like, when I started, when we started OpiLife, I had such uh, fear about it because you never really know as an entrepreneur where it's going to go. And I remember all these, um, again, I love, I love surrounded by seniors and they always said the worst you can do is just is, mm. is fail and you live in it yeah. right and a lot of them have actually said to me I wish I did I, w- I wish I did it too I always had this dream of like owning a construction company um but because of obviously circumstances I never took that risk and I wish I did sooner because it would have taught me different things the way I looked at it too even with like opening the clinic that I did was the way I framed it to myself was I could live with the regret of opening it and failing going bankrupt I can live with that I couldn't live with the regret of not trying. Yeah. That was it. But that's, that's where action occurs, right? Yeah. When you're, when you're too, you get to the point of, I'm not comfortable being here. Yeah. So what's on the flip side? Do it anyways. Yeah. And it, like, it, and what ends up stopping yeah. a lot of times is like literally fear. Like they get, you're just so timid by like the, the, fa- the failure. I'm like, but like, you can't be afraid to fail. Like that's where you learn. Like, you g- legitimately learn through failing. So, I have a question. Thank you for that. But I have a question when you were talking about regrets or reframing that. Does the opposite occur too where folks shut down and don't talk about things? Well, uh, for the social isolation. isolation yeah, or, or is there a breaking point where at some point every human being simply opens up and, and tells you what's sort of right inside their ribcage? What have you experienced? I think, so through my experience, I've seen both sides where they feel so there's not that communication aspect and it's being expressed through different things. Like sometimes they have, they want to stay in bed and they don't want to talk. Or um, if that's like through a migraine, like every time they shut down, they get this migraine because of the stress that's involved. Got it. Um, but is it a, there, is there a breaking point? There usually is. And that's when they create such a relationship with either myself or uh, with their caregiver where they start having that sense of, comfort and trust Mm -hmm. and then they start expressing it and usually we see that if they've been isolated for so long which is usually the case when they come on service with us they end up after like a month once they start to get comfortable because we see after a month with the caregiver they get a little more comfortable that's when you start hearing about the challenges that they're experiencing or their lived experience and how that's affected them and they usually have a good understanding as to what what that is um it's just like it's just that i don't there's I guess because of the way that as a caregiver, what understanding we have, there's a little more openness to it. And it's a beautiful thing because then we can implement resources and start the discussion and the conversation. Yeah, I got it. But it's not always the case where that happens, unfortunately. And it's, it's, just, it's just dependent on the person. Thank you. I love that. And, you know, the, the, the word that keeps showing up for me is trust. And I've heard oh, you yeah. talk about it over time. Mm. You know, you know, you've said something to me is trust is the currency. Yeah. And that's exactly what you're sharing and what you're sharing. And that's where sort of the magic occurs. Yeah. And that's when life shows up. So, like, uh, one of the things I always say um, is it, the currency is trust. And it's so applicable in, in any industry or in any standard. And there's ways we can garner that, right? And so connecting, getting people to open up, like, you're building trust. If you look on, you know, whether any business, you're going to look up Google reviews. Why? Yeah. 
because you're trying to see if I th can I trust this company to help me with whatever I need based off of the feedback from other people, right? Same thing if you're talking about a referral, right, of any kind. Hey, my my neighbor had this guy do my backyard. It was pretty good. Okay, I can trust my my neighbor's opinion. I think he's a solid individual. I'm going to use this person, right? And so the currency is trust. It, money is a confirmation, but ultimately it's trust, right? In our line of work, it's the same, right? Can I can I trust Selena to help my family member, right? Are they going to be there and help them for the needs that they require, right? And if that answer is yes, I'm not, like, like in that scenario, my money's gone. It's not valuable, right? Because I need that service. It's gone. There's no value. So currency typically has value, right? And so can we gain that trust? And if you're able to do that, you'll be all right. How conscious are people these days about at some point in your life, there's going to be a last for everything? The last time yeah. that you went on vacation, the last time that you swung a hammer, the last time that had sex, whatever. There's a, there's a bunch of lasts. And the older you get, more things are taken away instead of given to you. So mm -hmm. there's going to be more lasts showing up on the doorstep. Are people really conscious of these lasts I'd in say, life? I don't think no. so. Because they're I'm, not aware of it. Because no. huh? what, what, reframe it, right? Is that like, so let's say... Someone's 50. The average expectancy of life is what? 70s, 70, low 80s? Late 70s, 70, early 80s, 80s men or women, yeah. depending yeah. on, right? So think of it like this. How many more Christmases do you exactly. have? Right? Exactly. And so when you look at that number, because you'll think, well, I got years. I got time. No, you don't. You got, what, 10 more Christmases, 20 more Christmases if you're lucky? 20 Christmases. Like, that's a small amount if you really think of it. It seems like it's forever, but 20 not. Christmases or, or even less for some. And so... Once you think like that, it's like, whoa, I really don't have that much time. And you're not cognizant, so you kind of step into looking at it that. Otherwise, we'll look at it infinite time, and we think we have it until we don't. But these 30s and 40-year-olds, 40, 40 they think they're super men and women, just like, I got plenty of time. Well, they don't think about... Healthcare is so, so advanced now that we think we're invincible. So we're all going to magically live to we're 80 when that's, that's not reality. Well, it's the quality of life that yeah. you're going to live, right? Well, that's where I was saying you'll you'll die later, but you won't live as long. Yeah, and so, but like, you can't it, to 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 that individual's um, perspective is that they don't need to, or they haven't had the need to, right? Because they're going to rely on a failsafe. Hey, quality of life is so good. I'm living, so their perception of life is different, right? And that's okay, right? Like their perception of life was like I'm just I'm being. And that's not necessarily okay for everyone, but to their perspective, like that's that's why they're just not going to think about it. I think to that point, I think because I think there is like generally you do have for the general population, if you live till s late seventies, early eighties, it does seem like a long time, right? And there is that sense of from society where you enjoy your life for the amount of time you have, so enjoy every day, right? Um, but I think with comes with that is it's a scary slope because then people don't, they think they have so much time that they don't plan. Right. And one things that we see constantly is not thinking of retirement. Like everybody wants to retire. It's such like a, it's this glorified thing where you want to retire and we, at 65, you have to retire. Right. But nobody thinks about what that all means. And for fi financially or for care wise care, nobody thinks like, Oh, but I may get sick or I may need physio or they don't put, they don't have that they, because they think they have so much time. They don't think that, or they're invincible that they don't think about those things and they don't plan. So like for us, yeah, home care can be expensive. It's a one-on-one -on -one service. Uh, retirement is expensive in general if you want to go to a retirement home, but because people think that they have so much time, they don't put that money aside thinking that they are going to need it one day. Right. I know even too, it's tough, like to your point is that people don't even realize like the, the wait list to even get into a place is ridiculous. That's another thing. That's yeah, it, like, well, that's it's long-term care. Yeah. yeah. It, it's an, because it, there's know. different levels of, of care facilities, yeah. right? Yeah. So, it's you, so you got, you got ghetto and then you got okay and then you, it starts getting better from yeah. there, right? But the wait list for all of them, like it's just, it's, it's difficult. Uh, retirement homes is usually can be a few days, whereas yeah. long-term care, which is the most affordable one, that's where the wait list can be anywhere between a year to yeah. six years. So it's so it's so hard. And if you don't give yourself enough time or be 
honestly having an honest conversation with yourself and giving yourself enough time to plan you can be in a real you can be stuck in a real pickle yeah. where you don't know what to do and you're not getting that end quality of life and now you have wanted this retirement and now you're not getting it right and again if you going back to your question manny if you don't Ha- if you th- keep thinking that you have so much time, like I'm not thinking about it and keeping that denial that it's not going to come, then you're going to be stuck. And it's, it's, it's very challenging. And I feel for families when they say, unfortunately, my family needs this, but I can't afford it. And I'm in the long-term care home, long-term care home wait list, but my fam, but they're, they're like, they have years to go. So it's like, w- what do you do? Right. And the government can't do give much. So it, it's, it can be, it can be very sticky. Mm-hmm. Then the stress of that goes on to the family, like we were saying before, and then that can cascade into, you know, some of the, some of the stuff that we were saying before. Why Why did you guys choose this career? I mean, a lot, I, I've had people on the show before that left these careers, right? They got yeah. into construction yeah. Yeah. Uh, from from that kind of type of career. Um, I mean, so it's not it's not the happy go lucky career. You know what I'm, I'm saying? I'm, no. not, I'm sure it's not comedy night every day, right? And it, you go like, through a lot of stress. Yeah. yeah, a lot of stress, and you're taking on a lot of people's emotion, like. What, what Alberto said, it's a lot of therapy. Like I don't have the therapy in my yeah. in my title, but it is a lot of person to person and you take on a lot of their emotions in very tough circumstances. Uh, so is there nights where I cry for people? Yeah, and it's it can be stressful and you have to really think of yourself and make it an intention to take care of yourself. But for me, you don't go into this career for the money. If you are, you're going to be highly disappointed. Is there a lot of money in this car? <laughs> no. <laughs> give us a lot of money. You do not. We, we don't drive it for our <laughs> Yeah, that's what I thought. So okay. if you are going, if you're thinking that you're going to be a nurse or a physiotherapist and you're going to have a Ferrari and have a mansion, you're, you're in the wrong field yeah. um, because you're dealing with people's lives and you're dealing with them in a very vulnerable state. So you have to have a real passion to want to help people. Um, and that's why I went into it. Like my, my mom's a nurse and she was my model Uh, when I was growing up and I always said I wanted to help people and I thought the doctor was like the biggest thing to help people but the nurse has a full holistic perspective including the socioeconomic um, perspective of health and helping people has been my drive even during COVID when it was like the most extreme stress I've ever experienced in my life and my career Um, and that passion to help people in their most vulnerable part of their life has been the driving force for me Although sometimes I don't, like, we don't, um, it's, again, it's not, if you're going for the money, it's not it, because you don't, but if you do have that passion to keep going for people and for your community to make a difference, this is the career for you. Um, for myself, I'll answer your, que- your question, but a, a, a sl- slight tangent is that I always say you have to love the things that the, the dirty, gr- grimy things of the gig, right? Mm-hmm. Like the, the things that aren't glorious and, and sort of enamored, right? All the parts that you would hate, you have to love them. Otherwise, I know for a physio, like it's a short lifespan. I, I think it's like something to like eight years on average, people typically will move on. Oh, wow. Um, wow. Some, sometimes it could be more. Um, I don't know if that's still that the, the same number or not. Um, but yeah, you really have to love the the challenging parts of it. Otherwise... You're, you're you're not going to be in it. and I see a lot of times. Oftentimes, people say physio. It's 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 quite popular yeah. just because they like working out or being active or have some experience with it, and so they're enamored by it. I'm like, oh, I want to do that, and then it's like, well, they get into it, and you know, I've seen people where like they're in it, but they they're really not in it. And at the end of the day, the, the people are suffering, not in it. You know, so but in terms of why I got into it, it is um, I had a string of several like surgeries, um, two knee reconstructions, which I would call that a warm up. I take those two any day of the week versus <laughs> the, uh, the, the, the one I had at the end there, um, where I was kind of telling you, you know, before we started airing here was, um, fractured my leg pretty badly where it nearly had it amputated. So, um, the physio that I, I that sort of took care of me, um, shout out to Steve Hill at King's Cross. He's absolutely class. Um, yeah, first, first person to ever sort of kind of see someone change a, a life to a degree, um, and respected him wholeheartedly for it and kind of seeing the impact he had on everyone and helping him or helping me and, and everyone else in clinic, um, kind of opened me up to that. And then seeing how he fought for people in terms of trying to help them, um, 
I kind of wanted to do the same. So when I s- treat someone, I look at them like myself and I fight for them like I'm fighting for myself. So that's kind of how I got into it and still enjoy doing it to this day. But I mean, you guys must want to take a mental break as well too, right? Like you guys are there helping so many other people, but then who's there to help you? Because even <laughs> in construction, man, it's like, get away from me. I got to yeah. take a break from this, right? The biggest thing I tell people in healthcare or any profession is you can't help others if you can't help yourself. Right. And that's the, I tell everybody that from um, people that we mentor to even my, uh, some of our clients like it, and, and our caregivers, especially too, because our caregivers are the ones that are on the front line over being burdened too. And, uh, or taking that, that, that stress as well. So I always say, watch your back, but also watch, watch your mental health do check-ins, have your vacation if you need to. Like as a team, I always tell everybody, we have to take, we have to help each other because we're all going to need that mental break. And for me, that's like traveling or just getting out of the mind space. And sometimes it's just going to the gym and hemming out some iron. So, (laughs) um, but you do have to check in with yourself and mental health amongst healthcare providers is, is huge and it's not talked about as not enough because obviously the clients are, or our patients are very important to us, but we can't. We we need to be we need to be de-stressed and be in, in take care of ourselves in order to help others. Yeah, I'd probably say it's, it's burnout in, in our field. Oh, you know, yeah. in, in the medical field is For pretty sure. pretty high, um, and oftentimes we don't even notice it. Like we just kind of go through like the day to day and we just keep going. Okay. Tomorrow's another day. Okay. I got to help these set of people. I got this person tomorrow. Or, you know, if someone's in a hospital setting and like, we're going to have to go through this shift and I got, you know, Mike, John Smith, Sally, you know, in my roster of care. And so you're so fixated on the people you're helping for you neglect yourself. And it's, it's so common in the medical professional. It's so easy to do. And it, it is so easy. Yeah. Cause if you're in it to help others, you yeah. always put others before yourself. Yeah. But and there's always a person that's needing your help. Exactly. Yeah. Like that, line, constant that line need. doesn't end. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So you like, it's so easy to get in routine. Okay. Wake up, go to, go to the clinic, go to somebody's home, keep going, answer yeah. all phone calls. Like uh, I answer phone calls at any point in the day. Even overnights, because I have staff overnight. And there was a time where I wasn't sleeping for 72 hours. And obviously, you see the deterioration very quickly. But you get, it's so easy to get a routine and put yourself, because you have a lot of empathy. Like, I have a lot of empathy for people. And when they call me at 12 o'clock and they need a visit the next day, I, if I can't get a caregiver to go, I will go. Because I know they need the help. But it's so easy to get into that. And you have to, you have to intentionally check in. Yeah. And be like, is this something that I have to do? Is there somebody that can help? Can I delegate it? Um, or so do I need to sleep? Each other's back, right? Like, yeah. yeah. And that's Everyone's why I have, aware of it. Yeah. And that's why having such a supportive team as well. Like, shout out to my team because they always have my back. Um, but it's so important to have that uh, because you sometimes you don't even see it yourself too. You're yeah. on this roller coaster, and it's it's hard to get off. If <laughs> someone, I'm, I'm guilty of the same. Yeah. If someone wants to get in, what would you guys suggest? Like, what kind of person should get into this industry? You, you got to be authentic. Like I said from the get-go, you got to yeah. be authentic, and, and you 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 generally need to connect with people and want to. Because if someone can read it right away, if you're not being authentic and trying to connect to them to care for them, they're done. You, they're they're gonna exit, and they won't open up to you, right? Like you, that's that's how you can care for them. You need them to open up, right? And so, if if you're not, and you think you can half fast it. By all means, go for it. But I've I've seen clinicians who you know they're ju- they're just not simply there and caring enough that it, it, it's reflective. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you won't be successful if you yeah. don't have that compassion and empathy. So if you're doing it because you want to make a difference in people's lives in your community, it's the it's definitely um, the job for you because you have that impact. And if you're a direct, if you're at the bedside or yeah. directly with patients, you see it. You see their progress, and it's so rewarding. It, I was just going to say, it's, <laughs> like, it's so rewarding. It's like yeah. the greatest high. Like when someone when someone comes to you and says thank you, and like you're a part of that. Like y- y- it's just one of the greatest feelings. And yeah. even like when families come to us, like yeah. thank you so much for the services, exactly what we needed. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's so it it's so rewarding to us, and that's why we do it. So if you ha- want that and you want to contribute in that way, 
definitely for you and you can it's not I'm not saying it's not a challenging but it can be easy to get into if you have that um but if if you don't have that drive for that it's I would say consider something else um or if you don't know like if you don't really know go volunteer somewhere go to like a hospice um like in our community hospice Vaughn um they have all volunteer options where you can connect with clients and see if this is for you um you can go to a hospital you can do clinics Mm. like just get involved beforehand before you jump yourself in because you you also don't want to provide quality care and you also want to be successful right the last thing too is like you don't want to get into it spend all this money and and time education and time and then only to then realize i don't like it as much as i thought i did because you love the glorification of it and not the things that you know aren't so glamorous and I think a lot, even like for myself, when I was looking into healthcare, because I knew I always wanted to get healthier, um, I thought doctors was like the most glorifying thing. And But until I actually went, put myself beside a doctor, I'm like, maybe this isn't for me in terms of the medical field, but I loved helping people. And that's how I knew I liked helping people. So if that's be nursing, physio or anything, yeah. put your foot in the door, see if you like it, get your feet wet, um, get your hands a little bit dirty and see. And then if you do like it, continue it. Like if that's your passion, you feel like deep down inside, that's what you want to do. Try it. If you fail, like we said, if you fail, great. That's fine too. At least you tried. But you don't really know until you try. And I have so many kids that come to like volunteer in clinic or, you know, asking to see, hey, one, they need volunteer hours for physio school, right? And it's one of the things I would say is like, listen, you you really got to, Really love the parts, like I said, not to be redundant here, that aren't glamorous. But one thing I always say beyond that is, like, not only that, like, it's very competitive and difficult to get into physio school now, um, is that also realize there's so many different ways you can help. It's not just simply yeah. nurse. Like, the, the, there are always the ones that come to the top of the, the sort of the forefront, if you will. Doctor, physio, chiro, nurse, you know, occupational therapy. Like, there's even more um, areas that you can actually help people. And you can then explore those, right? And it's not so confined to just the sort of <clears throat> um, most common um, jobs in, within the medical health field that you can still help people. Like, it, there's so many avenues. I would say always explore that. Don't ever confine yourself to one. I got one more question for, for the guys. Just, uh, but, John, do you have anything else? I just th- thank you. This is, this is beautiful. No, this has been great. <laughs> this is a great conversation. You know, and, and there was a few points there that really um, – made me smile through all that. And the first thing was one of the questions many uh, volleyed over, right? And it comes back to think something you've said quite transparently is the old adage of, you know, put your oxygen mask on first before mm-hmm. you help somebody else. Yeah. Manny's said that quite frequently, and, and that's it. It's like you need to be whole and complete, and there's, there's checks and balances along the way because you, you're not going to be able to be of service to somebody else if you're if – you're, not okay yourself like it's like you know saying i'm gonna go see a doctor who doesn't see a doctor right you know i'm gonna go talk to a coach who doesn't have his own coach or her own coach it doesn't work that way we all need checks along the way right and the last thing that sort of showed up as you guys talked about that is is the reasons of why you got into where you got into and if i can illuminate something that really resonated with me alberto about clinic for you is I got when you talk about why you got into what you got into and that need and that um, desire to truly help people and to share this with the audience out there, there's a constant affirmation in clinic that really brings you back to that space. Alberto's got a wall of winners. And as somebody's helped, their name goes on the wall. And that's touching for me even to walk through that space because that's exactly why he got into it. I got into it to help Angelina and Ben and Jonathan. And there it is again, folks. Like, there it is. Like, this is why I do what I do. It's not because of whatever other tangible How come you didn't put me on that list? (laughs) (laughs) You got to earn it, man. You got to earn it. Those things just don't get up there. I'm aching. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not on that list. No, I'm just... So that's what shows up for me. It's like, there's that constant, hey, I know where I'm at. And by the way, here it is again on why I'm doing what I'm doing. And one of the reasons why I have that there is, is it's to pay it forward, right? Is that when someone comes in, they typically relatively hopeless to a degree they'll they'll sort of catastrophize what's going on hey like my foot hurts i can't walk again like no you can't right here's how um and there's there's a wall of people here that 
have varying stories and I always ask if someone is in clinic and they're nearing, you know, a graduation where they do sign the wall. It's like, hey, do you mind if I share your story a little bit? And you pay it forward because, and then they'll do it the same for the next person. And it's just to provide that perspective of like, hey, like we're all here um, fighting our own fight. And there's actually a mural. I'm gonna, mural I want to actually put up in, in the clinic is eh, it's kind of funny too, just being in Vaughn and having Italian stallion of Rocky Balboa <laughs> <laughs> shadow boxing. But is that it, it's a boxer facing a mirror with the reflection. And the only thing you see is the reflection. Um, and it's because everyone in there is just is fighting their own fight and, yeah. and you're, you have to focus on yourself, right? And um, not compare to anyone else, but yet still celebrate that in the same facet, right? Where you can then pay it forward. Um, I didn't ask this to both of you guys, but how young are people becoming uh, with issues? Like what's the youngest that you've seen Alzheimer's or you've seen dementia or you've seen, I guess, has it gotten younger? I'm just assuming. Um, I've seen people in their 50s get Alzheimer's. Um, I've seen people in their 90s get diagnosed with Alzheimer's. Um, is it getting younger from my experience? I don't know what the research says, but from our experience, yes, it is getting a little bit younger. Um, but even in retirement homes, like we were at a retirement home yesterday and the youngest person was, was 30 years old. Wow. So, um, not not as a fear tactic, but just as knowledge like that we've seen. Um, that that's that's all I can honestly say about that. I, I um, wouldn't be able to speak to it as well as Selena. Yeah. Of course, I don't. Like, well, I, with you, I want to find out like, like injuries, injuries, yeah. injuries. Yeah, yeah. yeah great. Like, what are people not necessarily just a sustained injury, like something traumatic happened, where it was a car accident or a fall yeah. or something like that, but just like it's rotary it, cuffs are falling apart people are falling apart like what kind of injuries are people doing to themselves yeah it, it, it's a tough question to really answer because it, it's so different um that people put themselves through right like it, it, it's so hard because like I, I see kids a lot right pediatric sports medicine right so those are like the high volume of of active individuals right people, kids from i've seen my youngest ever I, i've seen was a few months but that's something completely different um, youngest, like injury wise was like a four year old. Well, I'd say like nine months ago. Um, and then I also have like, you know, Alzheimer's post strokes, 90 year olds in clinic as well. And then everything in between at every activity, activity level. And a lot of it can be self-induced, but I'd say a lot of it now is, is especially post COVID that we started seeing like a lot of like neck and shoulder stuff. Cause people are just so much more sedentary and it does happen even in 20 year olds. I'd probably say more so since work from home, remote working, just because everyone's now sitting at their computer or laptop for eight hours straight, right? And so now they're coming in earlier with these neck issues and shoulder issues or low back just because they're more sedentary now than ever before. Mm. Um, like speaking to post-COVID or during COVID, a lot of what we've seen is more social isolation and the, the signs of depression. So when you because especially when seniors, when they were in their homes, the only people that they could have seen that because they were limiting interaction was maybe the caregiver. Mm -hmm. And even some then they said, I don't, I don't want service. So to social isolation was huge and trying to get out of that, especially some seniors are still fearful, which I totally understand. Um, it's that the more mental health component is probably more of what I've seen. Um, but again, like getting in there again to start the services, it's an open discussion because maybe they haven't experienced before and they don't know what they're even feeling. So when they have that trust back with the caregiver, it's now it's a discussion again when they bring it up and now we're able to, we are able to at least have some sort of intervention, but mental health is a huge thing coming out of COVID and even for healthcare workers, like the burnout again, right? It's huge. Well, think about it like during that time, like for me, like I can say for myself, like with COVID, Nothing really changed too much other than like, you know, we had to stop working in clinic for like two months. But then after that, we were back in clinic and, you know, people still have issues. And, you know, I never say no, like, hey, can I come in and try and get people in? And, um, you know, obviously at the time there, you had to kind of, we had to like sort of abide by different rules and stuff to, you know, seg separate um, uh, like people coming in and stuff. But yeah, I, and I remember too, actually, and I don't know how it was for you, Selena, but I remember my first week back in clinic um, after sort of we had about two and a half months off because of COVID that 
everyone was in lockdown and in isolation and going to, to see a physio was like their highlight of the day. And they had all this like pent up social energy that when I finished that week, I just felt like I ran a marathon. Mm -hmm. It was like, they just like, it was like, whoa. And you know, and, and I understand it. And it was, it was, but I, I remember just having that sort of introspective moment of like, whoa, that I've never felt like that before. Um, and it was pretty neat, but you could see it though. Like it was so palpable that people would come in with all this pent up social energy because there was no outlet. I feel like I saw the opposite though. Did you really? Yeah. yeah. Where people were more reluctant to socialize. Oh. And that was mainly with seniors, not around mm. our gen like our generation, but because they got so used to being isolated. Again, it's a cyclic effect that yeah. they didn't want to isolate. They didn't wait how on to keep isolating. And it is around the fear of them dying because a lot of their friends usually were dying of COVID, um, which is so unfortunate and it causes a fear. And it, again, I don't blame them, but because because they felt so used to that social isolation, bringing somebody in is is, is very challenging. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Mm -hmm. So one last question. Sorry. Um, what are some clear signs of depression at any age? Um, so the clearest one that I've seen is withdrawal of something they love. So if that's so recently I went to a home and the, 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 um, our client, she loved knitting. Absolutely. Did. She's been doing it since she was 16. She knitted stuff for her family members and they have, it's like, re it's very rewarding for her because she would give it as a gift to her family and they would come in proudly wearing it. And then all of a sudden recently she stopped doing it. And, um, and that was also her withdrawing from her friends too, because she was in a retirement home and she didn't want to go downstairs anymore. Um, but the most common one is them withdrawing from what they love. Um, and also very, very easily, um, gets angry, aggravated. So you have to, like, when I have conversations with them, it's a very compassionate conversation and very patient. Um, and some family members have a hard time with that because they, they want to see them, their family member happy and they want to see it quite quickly because it's hard to see. Um, but those are the two, I would say. I think, again, yeah. nailed it on the head. Like that's yeah. literally the, the clinical definition. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like, not much you're going to say <laughs> on that. Yeah. Um, okay. So, but yeah. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anything else, Jonathan, you want to bring up? No, thanks. It's been, it's been awesome. Likewise. It's been awesome. It's been great. Thank you again. So everybody can reach out to Jonathan Sinelli at uh, jonathansinelli.com on Instagram at Jonathan Sinelli. And then his email is jc at jonathansinelli.com 416-717-4139. Uh, Selena's at Opulife uh, Inc. And then it's www.opulife.ca. That's you. Correct, yes. Correct, yeah. And then it's 647-400-1074. And the email is selena at opulife.ca. And on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, you find them under at opulife.ca. Uh, and then Alberto is www.premierphysiotherapy.com, 905-417-9991. On IG at premier.physio. And then reception at premierphysiotherapy.com. That's everything, right? I want to do the 12 questions with you guys because you've done it already, but I want to do it with you guys. And you guys are around construction, so this will still work. What is your favorite construction word? Word? Word. word. Construction word. <laughs> I'm trying to think. Yeah. <laughs> I've been in the home care world for so long that... I GC the clinic myself. So, <laughs> yeah. so you should have a construction word there. Don't GC a clinic by yourself. I don't know. Oh, I did, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely don't do that. <laughs> Say that first thing. <laughs> it was fun. What would be one? Oh, that's not that was I don't know your I'll favorite go, home I'll, care word. I don't know. I'll go, I'll go lumber. Why not? Lumber? Yeah. <laughs> home care word. <laughs> home care word. I think um, uh, compassion. Least favorite tool. Handsaw. No, it doesn't what have to be a physical say? tool. It doesn't have to be a physical tool. Oh, I tool. thought you were still going on the construction side. It could side be anything. Like oh, our, our prime ministers come up on that question. <laughs> <laughs> Savage. So it's just least favorite tool. Mm, least favorite tool. <laughs> These are tough questions. Yeah, you, you don't I think, to think about, about it. it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have a bit of fun with it. You know when you're a kid in elementary school, you have to do those circles with the needle in the middle? And you yeah. Like the yeah, yeah. Yeah, that. 
That but you got a lot of perfect circles out of that. Yeah. It was useless by the end of yeah. it. But. but it was like you had to like get the pencil in there with a the little screw, yeah. make sure, but you couldn't go too tight. Otherwise, the compass. pencil Wasn't cracked. it called a compass? Was it a compass? Oh, I was, I can't remember what it was I called. I can't remember what it was called. I'll say that. Yeah. Anything coming to mind, Selena? Least favorite tool. Hmm. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I'm looking at Ben because <laughs> sometimes he knows me. Oh. <laughs> Lisa's yeah. name didn't come up. Lisa, Ben, you know you're not the least favorite tool. They're Lisa, both you stuck. Survive, yeah? <laughs> I, can, I can leave it. Don't worry. What construction sound do you guys love? Oh, nailing. When they hit the nail. Yeah. I'd say the same. <laughs> with a hammer or with a pneumatic? Hammer. 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 Yeah. Oh, I like it that. Yeah, you got to go nostalgic with it. Favorite <laughs> beverage? Coffee. Yeah, coffee. Sorry. No worries. Espresso. It's worse. Espresso <laughs> yeah. Worst and best part of construction. But I guess it'd be worst and best part of your occupation. We're, I can I can I can say from a construction standpoint, sure. Because we recently renovated a home, um, and I, sometimes the sorry, say the question again. Worst and best part of construction. The worst part is probably trying to work with so many trades, and they don't communicate with one another. The best part is seeing the end result of all the hard work. Oh, I got to follow up that answer now. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Well, sorry. is it the communication with the trades is because they speak different languages other than English? That <laughs> or is and it just also common sense? when you have like you know if you have so yeah. many trades, you have your plumber, electrician. Sometimes they don't communicate to one another, so you have your, your GC that does it all. But them sometimes them not listening to, and you have to communicate multiple multiple times. If they just spoke to one another, they would it'd be a little bit. I think too. Even like I remember like building the clinic out was that. Everyone was always complaining about the the trade before them, and like oh, if, yeah. they, if there was just a bit of like decency, just to know what for one another, like it would have been <laughs> like a little bit of compassion. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. What's I the know. best part for you? Best part of of physio or construction? No, or either. Mm. The best part is the the creativity you can you can build. Favorite curse word? Oh, it's got to be the f word. Curse word. Oh. Yeah, probably. It's just so versatile. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite vehicle, any mode of transportation? Favorite vehicle. Any mode. I, I'm going to have to say, like, just like a bicycle, like riding a bike, just because um, it carries so many fun stories with a bunch of friends of mine that everywhere we go, we typically ride a bike all over. But as you get older, the group gets smaller. Th this group's pretty cool. Like the, oh, okay. the, the four of us, five of us technically, and... Uh, um, but yeah, everywhere we go, we, we ride a bike, um, and it just creates one hell of a story. So I'll say that. That's actually true. I like planes. Planes? Yeah, flying. Like Cessnas or? Uh, no, just an average plane. Oh. So you can travel. <laughs> 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 you can go so far with a car, yeah. but with, um, but I, I, like we all, we love to travel, seeing different things. So being able to go to different destinations, experience different cultures, because it also helps with our work too. Um, understanding different languages, like I we I love that. Uh, what do you guys miss from your childhood? Creativity. I don't think that's. Sorry, Alberto. No, no, no. Um, I don't think that's emphasized enough, and I don't think it's practiced enough. Um, I agree. that's within my industry because sometimes in our industry, we have a one size fits all. Um, and that's, it's in healthcare and education. There's so many things when I speak to people, it's like, there's, there's no allowance for creativity. Um, yeah, sorry. No, I don't have to apologize. Um, sorry, say that one more time, Manny, if you don't mind. What do you miss from your childhood? Singing. Singing? <laughs> oh, no, I can't sing. Um... <laughs> Yeah, it's a tough one, actually. I don't know. Is it not playing golf earlier? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you were playing Switch. golf as a child? No, no. You wish you did. I, no, I wish I did, maybe. <laughs> I just took it up. Not not great. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't think I, I miss too much. I, I kind of enjoy all the memories that I have. I don't know. Yeah. I don't think yeah, I actually fair miss enough. anything. Yeah. What profession other than your own would you guys like to attempt one day? Professional golfer, eh, Ben? <laughs> <laughs> um, I always, I always said uh, development, like uh, retirement development, so construction, in that sense, or project management. Mm. Pilot would be pretty cool. Mm. Yeah. What profession would you guys not like to do? Politician. 
Sorry. Sorry, Chido. Don't, don't. First of all, there's no skill set attached to that. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would I not like to do? Truck driver. This so is much so, res- sedi- so so sedentary. I, mm. I have so much respect for them, though. Yeah, it's crazy. It's I when I, I I drove across because uh, I used to live in Calgary. And I drove from Calgary to Toronto. Uh, it was actually really cool. Me and my dad, but drove a truck with the uh, so kind of lived the life there. I was like, my back was so sore. Like I felt destroyed after that. So like, yeah, I would not like to do that. That, that hurt. A tough one. Yeah. Last question: If heaven exists, what would you guys like to hear God say when you arrive at those pearly gates? This is quite deep, but I yeah. would say that you you did enough. Because I think in life, we always think we can do more. Mm-hmm. Um, and we I think, like especially someone that's uh, an entrepreneur, you feel like you can always do more. You can always work more. You can ever, always go your extra mile. You can always make someone happier, like especially in our field. So to know that we, <laughs> that we did enough and that we were able to satisfy um, and contribute to our society in such a positive way, I think that I think would be great. It's funny, as soon as you said it and then you started talking, it was like literally the same because instinctually it was like, well done. Yeah. For the same reasons. Um, Well done. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Jonathan, for setting this up. Appreciate it. My pleasure. It's been great great to meet you guys. Thank you so much for sharing. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you so much for the opportunity. Yeah. It was fantastic. It was great. It was a great conversation. Thank you. That's it. We're out of here.